Sechas Yivam is Daf Kuf Yud Ches takes us to the end of the fifteenth parak of the Masechta. It contains four Mishnayos and four pretty separate sugyas. The first is discussing what happens when you have two co-wives who came back from Medina Sayyam with conflicting reports about what happened to their husband. Do you believe one with regards to the other? The Gemara will have three cases in the Mishnah in which we need to explain how they all fit together. Then we get to our next Mishnah, which will discuss what happens when you have women who are not believed to testify for each other. Are they believed, at least as regards to Ksuba? We'll have another Mishnah, which has a similar type of question, but not Yavamos related, about what happens when somebody's not sure whom he married. What does he do as far as Ksuba goes? And then our last Mishnah for the Daf will discuss the subject of what happens when a woman travels to Medina Sayyam together with her husband and her son, or possibly her mother-in-law, or maybe even a brother of her husband, and we don't know what happened to any of them. How does it affect her halacha and her status with regards to Yibam? What do we believe her to say? So let's begin. The Mishnah said that there were three cases as to what happens when you have two tsaras, two co-wives, both come back from Medina Sayyam with conflicting reports. First case, one said the husband is alive, one said he died. The second case, they both agree that he died, but they disagree as to how. One said he died naturally, one said he was killed. And the third case doesn't specifically discuss a tsara, but it also could refer to a tsara. It talks about where two women give conflicting report about a man, or two regular witnesses give conflicting reports about a man. Now, the first case and the last case, there's no machokas listed. In the first case, the halacha that is said in the Mishnah is that the one, the tsara who says that her husband had died, is allowed to remarry, and the one who said her husband is alive is not allowed to remarry. As we've seen, a tsara cannot testify for her other tsara, even um, as far as irrelevant to herself, what is not believed on the other, because we concern there may be discord between them and she's trying to mess her up. Now, the last case, we also say that she can't get remarried, you have conflicting reports. The middle case, where they agree that she died, they agree that he died, is Machlokas about how, here you have Machlokas between Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Hidur of Shimon. Rabbi Meir says, since they are conflicting, neither of them are trustworthy, even though they both agree that he died, something's wrong, and neither of them can get remarried. Rabbi Hidur and Rabbi Shimon say they both agree that he died, they disagree how, so we take the common factor between them, and we assume that he is dead, and they can both get remarried. Again, their testimony on each other is void, and they're each saying, my own husband is dead, so they can get remarried based on their own word. So the Gemara's first question is, what happens when one says the husband died, and the other one says nothing, she's quiet? The implication from the first case is that the two women would both be allowed to remarry, because we only said where one says he's alive, that she can't remarry. But if she didn't say anything, then the implication would be that she could remarry. And the problem is, why should that be? We said that one Sarah, a co cannot testify on her other. And in this case, you only have one co saying that he died, and the other was not saying anything. So the testimony of the first should not apply to the second, because we're afraid that she hates her, and she's trying to mess her up. So the Gemara says, you're right, that halacha is true, she cannot remarry. The M- M- Mishnah here is even in teaching what it considers to be a bigger chiddush, that even if she says, if the second co-wife says that my husband is alive, she still can't remarry. Why is that a bigger chiddush? Because and you have a situation like this, where they are specifically arguing with each other. One says he's alive, and one says he died. We may actually assume that the one who says he's alive, not really is he alive. She's trying to mess up the first co-wife because she has discord with her. and She's trying to make her an aguna forever after and saying that her husband's alive, even though she really knows that he is dead. And therefore, we would consider, since the one, since a woman is testified that she's believed in halacha to say that her husband did die, so the first Sarah who says that he died should be believed. And the second one, we should say, ah, she's just trying to mess her up. And even though she's messing herself up as well, but like Shimshon went down with the... Polishtim, Thomas Nafshi, Im, Polishtim, she's willing to go down to ship herself. And if it's a bigger Kiddush to say in that case that we don't let her remarry. I would think maybe we should let her remarry even against what she says, because she's just trying to mess up her cover. Certainly, in case where she says nothing, there is no testimony um, other than the other Tsar who can't testify for her. She is not able to remarry.
All right, now the Gemara wants to know why is there a machlokus only in the middle case and not in the first case? In the middle case, you had Rabbi Meir's opinion, who held that since they are conflicting, since they are contradicting each other, you don't believe either of them. So in the first case, you should also say that. They're also contradicting each other. One says he's alive, one says he died. You shouldn't believe either of them. So the Gemara says two ways that Amaram addressed this. You have Rabbi Elazar, who says that you're right, the first case is a machlokus as well. The Mishnah only listed the opinion of Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Huda, which is that the co wife who says her husband died can remarry. The other one, um, the uh, opinion of Rabbi Mayer in this case as well would be that even she can't remarry because you have conflicting reports. Now, that's the first approach, Rabbi Elazar's approach. Now, Rabbi Echanan said that no, Rabbi Meir would agree in the first case that the co-wife who says her husband had died, that she can remarry, even though there's conflicting reports. And that's because Chazal believed the woman is a special name is given to a woman to testify that her husband had died. And therefore, they are not considered, it's not considered conflicting reports here. The one who says he died is not facing anybody down. There's a conflicting report against her, but she's believed. But that believability only exists in a case where one says he's alive and one says he died. There's a special belief that's given to the one who says that he died. If you have two different ways that he died, that's already, Chazal didn't give a special nemonis to one over the other, and therefore we are concerned something is fishy here, and that's where Rabbi Meir argues. Now the Gemara says, let's try to apply the opinion of these two Amaram to the third case. The third case we had said that if you have women giving conflicting reports, and the say it should be true, even by Tzara, if they have conflicting reports as to whether or not he died, one says he's alive, one says he died, that you can't allow her to remarry. Now, uh, according to Rebekhan, this is a problem, because Rebekhan said that everybody agreed that if they have conflicting reports, one says he, he's alive, one says he died, that Rabbi Huda says that here... Um, Rabbi Yechonin says that here, even Rabbi Meir would agree to Rabbi Yudim Shimon that she is allowed to remarry because we assume, like Chazal believed, the one who said that he died. So here, how come she's not allowed to remarry? That's a problem. And therefore, it's going to be a problem on Rabbi Yechonin how this fits. According to Rabbi Elazar, you don't have a problem here because you would say that this is a machlokis as well. This last line is the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda, of uh, Rabbi Meir, who says that you can't believe the one who says that he died when there is conflict and contradiction. Okay, now we'll start our next Mishnah. This Mishnah discusses, again, situations where you have a woman who's not believed. So we said that a woman is not believed to testify that her tsara is allowed to remarry because the husband died. She's also not believed to testify that her mother-in-law is allowed to remarry because her uh, husband died. And again, the concern is that there is discord between them and she's trying to mess her up. So here the Mishnah says, okay, I understand that they're not believed to allow in both these circumstances, testi- testimony for a tsara and for a mother-in-law is not believed to allow them to remarry. But what about a different halacha? What about eating chuma? Let's say the woman in consideration that Sarah and the mother-in-law are a basi soul married to a coin. You're assuming that the husband is alive now. You're not believing the testimony that he died. Does that mean that you could assume that he's alive even Lakula? Does that mean you could assume that she's allowed to eat truma? If he's alive, she should be allowed to eat truma, but that's now a kula. So when we say we don't believe that Sarah and the daughter-in-law, that's Lechumra, we're concerned she might be lying, but we cannot allow her to assume that she's lying, and therefore either Truma or even Lekua. So the Gemara says the, the Mishnah says the Machlokas, Rabbi Tarfin and Rabbi Kiva. Rabbi Tarfin says even Lekua. We assume that the Tzara and the daughter-in-law are lying, and even Lekua, they are lying, the husband is assumed to be alive, and she's allowed to eat Truma. Rabbi Kiva says, no, you have to get them out of doing it there, you have to be Choshish both ways. You are afraid she might be lying, but you're also afraid she might be telling the truth. And therefore, although the Tsara and the mother-in-law can't remarry, they still can't eat Shuma. That way we cover all the possible scenarios over here. Now, the Gemara asks, the Gemara begins, the Gemara asks, why do we have to say this in both the cases of the mother-in-law and the Tsara? Why don't you say one, I should know it for the other. So the Gemara says, because... One is a bigger chiddush than the other, and therefore I need to say it so that I can know both the opinions of Rabbi Tarfin and Rabbi Akiva, which is the bigger chiddush. So the tzara is more likely to have uh, hatred towards her tzara than uh, daughter-in-law is towards her 
mother-in-law. If you remember the reasons for the discord between them, Atsara loses her husband's physical attention because he has to divide it between her and the Tsara. And physical lack of attention is more painful than what happens with the mother-in-law, and that is the mother-in-law speaks evil of uh, the husband to the daughter, speaks evil of the daughter-in-law to the husband, and that's why she doesn't like her, potentially. So, the, the, therefore, there's more hatred between sorrows than there are between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. Now, so therefore, I need to say a chiddush both ways. I need to say that even in the case of the two sorrows where there's a lot of discord, still Rabbi Tarfin, um is still, Rabbi Akiva says, you have to be choshesh that she's not lying. And in the case of the mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law, where there's not so much discord, still Rabbi Tarfin says there, you can assume that she's lying, and you don't have to be afraid that she's not lying. Now, what? who is the halacha like over here? So the more close Rabbi Yudah Mishmuel says, halacha is like Rabbi Tarfin. Abai says we learned as well that the halacha is like Rabbi Tarfin. We could see that that's proven from an upcoming Mishnah. That Mishnah, which we shall see shortly, is discussing a case where a woman went to Medina Siyam with just her husband. She came back and she reported, while I was in Medina Siyam, I had a son. Now, two uh, potential things happened. The son died and the husband died. The question is who died first. So if she says that the son, that um, the 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 uh, son died first and then the husband, so then we believe her fully because it, that's the situation which we understood it to be anyway. Had she not said anything, we would have assumed she didn't have a son and she falls to Yibam. So she said, no, I had a son, but he died. Okay, that doesn't change things. However, if she said that my husband died first, and I had a son at the time that he died, and therefore I'm not falling to Yibam, so now we're already a little suspicious, because we don't see the son, and we didn't know she had a son. So there, it says, she's not believed, She we don't allow her to go free to the Shuk based on this son that she claims, but we do have to be choshishin lidvareha. We do have to be concerned for her words. Maybe she's telling the truth, and therefore we can't allow her to just do yibum, assuming that she never had a son and that she falls to yibum. So therefore, she has to get chalitza. So the Gemara says, so the dik is choshishin lidvareha means it's only for her words that we do. We are concerned. We're not choshish for someone else's words, and that's our case where we're not worried by the tsara or the daughter-in-law as far as being allowed to eat. Shuma, like Rabbi Tarfin says, it has zero effect. Now we get to our next Mishnah, which is not on the topic of Yibam, but it does show a continuation of the Machlokis of Rabbi Tarfin and Rabbi Kiva. We'd seen that Rabbi Tarfin seemed to say, we're not worried. We allow you to uh, assume a certain way. We don't have to try to fulfill all the possibilities that there are. Rabbi Kiva said, no, you have to fulfill both possibilities. Can't allow her to eat truma, can't allow her to remarry. So here you have a similar discussion where Rabbi Tavon says, you pick one way and you go with it. And Rabbi Kiva says, you have to fulfill all the options. And there are two cases in this mission which are very similar. One is where somebody married a woman, he doesn't know who. It's one of five. So he obviously has to give a get to her. The question is, what does he do about Iksuba? Now, he can stay married to all five if he wants, or he can continue the marriage to all of five. But should he not want to marry, not want to stay married to any of them, or to all of them, they all require a get, because they all might be his wife. So the question, though, is what about the ksuba? If he's divorcing them, only one of them is his real wife, so only one really deserves a ksuba, what should he do with it? Next case is where he stole something from someone and he wants to give it back, but he doesn't know who he stole from. And again, if it's one of five people, you have the same issue, which one does he return it to? So in both of these, Rabbi Tarfin says, he just puts it down between them, both the Ksuba and the stolen object, and they'll either fight over it, or they'll divide it, they'll figure it out. He gave it to, he returned what he needs to return, he gave the Ksuba he needs to give, and he doesn't have to do more than that. Rabbi Kiva says, no, he has to make sure he's covered. He has to give a ksuba to all five women, even though he only owns one. And he has to return the object to all five people who he may have stolen from, even though he only owes one. Now, this Mishnah talked about where he married a woman with Kedushin. The Lashon was Kidesh. And the case of the uh, returning was that he stole something. Now, the Gemara says there's a different Brisa, which considers slightly different versions one would be that he wasn't Mekadish with Kedushin, but he did a Bia. He did a Kedushin Bia, and he doesn't know to whom. There, he's more at fault, because he did something. He took advantage of one of these 
women. He did a potential iser. There are button you're not supposed to do kedushin bibia, and he did that. It's considered a pritzas. And also, he, whichever one he did the bia too, he had an effect on. She is now uh, somewhat altered by his actions, and therefore he's more responsible. Now, as far as the case of the uh, returned object, so. We have it that he stole something. There he did an iser. But it could be that he just took something from a, one of them. He borrowed something or he had something as a picado and whatever it is. It doesn't have to be an iser. So interestingly, in the first case, our Mishnah chooses the lighter case where it was Kiddushin and not Bibia. And there's less of a penalty against him. In the second case, we choose the stricter option, which is that there is a strong penalty against him because he stole and we don't talk about the lighter case, which is where he just took something without an iser happening. So the Gemara says this is problematic because what is the correct version of this? What is the correct version of this machlokas? Is actually a machlokas tanaim in a brisa. Shimon ben Elazar says that the argument is only in the severe case where there is a bia and a gzela, and therefore it's against him. However, if it was just kedushin, which is lighter. There's no reason to penalize him. There, uh, Rabbi Akiva would agree that you only have to give it back to one of them and figure it out. He, he doesn't have to give exuba to all five. And in the case where he took something, and there is no reason to uh, penalize him there. Um, again, Rabbi Tavon would agree that you don't have to, uh, that is, Rabbi Kiva would agree that you don't have to return it to each of them. You didn't do anything wrong, you just took something. Here, the Brisa, uh, it's quoted, explains that it means you bought something, and you have to pay for it. You don't know who you bought it from. So, there, they all agree, you didn't do anything wrong, there's no kanas against it, you only have to return it once. You don't have to return it to all five. So, the question, though, is uh, what does the Tanakama argue on Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar says that the Machlokasin, Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Tarfin is only in the severe case, where there was a Bia and there was a Gzela. But he says specifically it's not in the other case. It implies that there's someone else out there who holds the other way. He holds that it's only in the light case. The light case, which is where it was Kiddushin, not Bia, and it was uh, where you bought something and not that you stole it. So, our mission doesn't fit either of them. Our mission takes the light case as far as Kedushin, and the stronger case, the more severe case, as far as stealing, where you stole as opposed to having bought something. So who does our mission go like? So the Gemara answer is, when our mission says Kedushin, it means Kedushin Bibia. And therefore, it's really going like Roshim ben Elazar. It's talking about Abia, and it's talking about where you actually stole the object. So it's the more severe version. Now, the Gemara ends up, the reason that we talked about Kedushin and stealing, the reason why we need both cases is to show the strength of, of the positions of each of them. That even in a case of Kedushin, even though it's Bibiya and it's an Isser, but it's only an Isser Durabanon, still Rabbi Kiva says he's got to return it to all five. He has to give Exuba to all five. And as in the case of stealing, we did an Issa Daraisa, you may think there, Rabbi Tarfin would agree that we can ask him to give to five, but no, even there, Rabbi Tarfin argues and says you only have to give to uh, one and let them figure out how to split it. Now we begin the final Mishnah of the Perak and the Daf. And the Mishnah discusses a number of scenarios where the woman and her husband both went to Medina Siyam along with another potential uh, issue concern or individual and the question is she comes back alone what do we believe her for so the first case we have four cases the first case is where she went to Medina Siam with her husband and her son so when she left the assumption was that there was no Yibim in her future because she has a son she came back alone she said my husband died and my son died so if she says the husband died first then she's saying her st- she's saying that her status halakhically is the same that it is when she left she had a son at the time of the death of her husband. She doesn't fall to Yibim. Therefore, we believe her. She doesn't go to Yibim. She's free to go to the Shok. She does not require Chalitza. If she says vice versa, she says my husband, um, she says my son died first, and therefore I fell to Yibim, and I have to do Yibim, now we're a little suspicious, because the time she left, we assumed that she had a son, and she wasn't going to Yibim. Now she says, no, I do go to Yibim, because my son, my son died, and he died first. So, 
The halacha here is, is that we don't trust her, but we do have to be concerned for what she said. So she cannot do yibum based on what she said, because we're afraid maybe she had a special connection to the yavam, and she wants to marry the yavam. We don't trust her, so she can't do yibum. However, we don't allow her to be free to the shuk, so therefore she requires chalitza and not yibum. Okay, second case is where she went, just her husband, and now she comes back and she says, I had a son while I was away, and he died. So this is the case we saw quoted by the Gemara earlier. So if she says that son died first, she's not changing the status. She's saying that I had a son, he died. My halacha doesn't change. Either way, at the time of the death of my husband, I had no children, and I uh, fall to even. So there, we trust her. No issue. Um, whether we trust her or not, we have the same halacha completely, because we assume she goes to even. If, however, she says, I had a son there, and my husband died first, and then the son died, and therefore I do not fall to Yibam, I'm free to go to the Shuk. Here, we don't trust her, we're afraid she wants to get away from the Yavim, she hates the Yavim, and therefore we cannot uh, believe her to say that she's free to the Shuk. So we don't allow her to marry to the Shuk based on her testimony that she had a son who died. However, we do have to be concerned for it, we cannot just allow her to do Yibam, and therefore we do force the Yavim to do Chalitza, so she gets Chalitza and not Yibam. Next case, third case, is where she went to Medina uh, Siam with her husband and her mother-in-law. She had no children, but she also had no brother of her husband. She had no Yava. So there, the assumption when she left was that she wasn't going to fall to Yibam, and if, there, if her husband would die in Medina Siam, she would be free to go to the Shuk, because there is no Yava. Now, she comes back and she says, I had a Yavam. It was born in Medina Siam. While I was there, my mother-in-law gave birth, and I had a Yavam, and I fell to Yibam. My husband died, and I fell to Yibam. But my Yavam has also died. So here it makes no difference who died first, whether she fell to Yibam or she didn't fall to Yibam. She isn't falling to Yibam now, because the Yavam that existed is dead, according to her words. And that's what we assume the scenario was before she left. So either way... We trust and we assume that there is no Yavim around. We're not going to say maybe she's right that there was a Yavim and maybe she's wrong that he died first. Or even if he didn't die first, maybe he's, she's wrong that he died at all and therefore there really is a Yavim that she falls to Yavim. No, we don't require anything. She can go to Shek just like she was when she left over here. Now, the last case is where there was a Yavim. She, her husband, and her Yavim, that's her husband's brother, went to Medina Siam all together. She comes back alone. Now we, before she left, were under the assumption she is going to fall to Yibam, to that Yavam, to the brother who is alive. Now she came back and she said, my husband died, and my Yavam also died. Now here, um, the claim that she's making is that she doesn't fall to Yavim, which we would have assumed. Now, we believe her that her husband died. Um, but if Yavim died, again, it doesn't matter here whether it's before the death of the husband or after the death of the husband. Either way, her claim is that she didn't fall to Yavim, and our understanding is that the Yavim is still alive, and therefore she did fall to Yavim. So she's not believed either way, and she cannot marry Lashuk. We have to wait for her to get Chalitza from the Yavim, who she claims had died. So she's kind of stuck. And the Gemara, the Mishnah, rounds the out and says, the reason is because a woman is trusted to say that her husband died, she does not have any nemonas to say that her Yavim has died. That wasn't given to her. Also, if her Yavim happens to be married to her sister, so she has an Isra Achaz Ishto, she's also not believed to say that the sister died, and now she can do Yavim. That's in a different scenario. So as the Mishnah, the same is true for a man. A man is not believed to say that my my brother has died, and therefore my wife is going to be free to go to the Shuk after I die. And he's also not believed to say that my wife died, and now I can do even to her sister. That's, he is to show evidence of that. So no one's believed here as far as Yavams and sisters are concerned. Okay, the Gemara now begins, and the Gemara has a Shaila, unrelated question, which the Gemara wants to prove from this Mishnah. The question is, if a man wants to give a get for his wife, and not in her presence, he wants to make a zikoi, that is, he wants to appoint a man to be her shliach lekabala, and give that man the get, that when the man receives it, he's doing it on behalf of the woman. So we have a rule, such an activity is allowed to be, is allowed to be done if we assume that the recipient 
is someone is it, it, what that recipient is receiving is something that's good for them. So you're allowed to give a gift to somebody, even if he's not there, by making an agent to represent him, because it's good for him to receive a gift. The question here is: Is it good for a woman to receive a gift? So generally, if it's just a divorce where there's no U.M. situation attached, it's bad. A woman doesn't want to be divorced. You would not be allowed to do Zach and Ladam Shalib Bifanov. It's not considered to be his chos. It's not considered to be a benefit for her. The question is, what if he's getting her out of Yivam? He's about to die, and she's going to fold even to his brother. And uh, he wants to give a get to someone on her behalf to get her out of Yivam. Is that considered to be his chos or not? So that would depend on what her relationship is with her Yavam. If she likes the Yavam, then that would be a problem, because that blocks her from marrying somebody that she wants. It's not a schos, she should not be allowed to do that. If she hates the Yavam, it would get her away from him. She wouldn't have to get Yivam or Achalitza from him. So, which is it? So the Umar says, we can prove from our Mishnah that we're concerned both ways. Because our Mishnah said, based on her testimony that she came back, we are choshishin for her words, we are concerned for her words, whether she's blocking herself from Yibum or she is making herself do Yibum, right? In the case where she says the son died. Whether she, if she says that the son died, was born and died after the husband, so she's blocking herself, she is blocking herself from Yibum, we're concerned for her words, and therefore we have to be afraid that maybe she hates him unduly. Or if she says, we knew she had a son, and she says that the son died before the husband, now she's saying that she fell to Yibam. Also, we're concerned that she has an ulterior motive that she wants to do with Yibam, because maybe she loves the Yibam. So you see, either way, we are concerned that maybe she has some other idea. So we are concerned both ways, and therefore it's not considered certainly to be a Zuchus. A related question, Limar says that Ravina asked Rava, somebody who wants to give a get to his wife as a Zuchus, and it's known that they're fighting. There's an argument between them. Do we consider it as chos because we know that they're in a fight? Or do we say, no, even though there's a fight, she still prefers to be married than to be single? Tomorrow so brings a proof. Tomorrow says that Rishlaka says this common expression that women have. It's better to be two bodies than one. Better not to be alone. And Abayah says there's a uh, quote that people say that if uh, a woman has... Uh, there's three quotes which all show that a woman prefers a husband of any sort over no one. If someone, if a woman, so the first quote is if a woman has a husband who's short as a ant, she still would rather have her chair be amongst the free women than amongst the single ones. Her papa says even if her husband is a comber of wool, which is a very lowly job, it's not embarrassing, she's still happy to call him loudly so everybody could hear and sit together in the streets so everyone can see that she is married. Ravashi says, even if he has a questionable inheritance, questionable yichos, and therefore it's a little bit disreputable to be married to him, still, all she wants from him is lentils for the pot, so she should have what to cook, and she's happy to be married to him. Now, the Gemara says, the potential reason for all of this is because she may want to be Mizana, which is afraid of what's going to happen with the kids. It'll show that she... Mm, an issue. So therefore, by being married, she has no story about the kids because she could always say that the kids are from her husband.